and Shia. I'm a graphic designer plus all sorts of other things, uh, living and working here in New York City. Um, I spend my, uh, I teach motion graphics at Parsons, it's something that's very important to me and I love doing. Um, I spend my days currently working at Pentagram on Emily Oberman's team, um, and I spend my nights and weekends working on my own work, uh, some uh, you will see today. Sorry, that was a mistake. I just sort of zoom through in the beginning and then I will kind of pause on everything. Um, but uh, beforehand, uh, I would love to thank Ellen, Sasha, Kara, and Barbara, um, and the wonderful team here at Tafel Graphics for inviting me to this conference, um, especially after our previous <laughs> distinguished speaker. Um, it's not something that I take really for granted, you know, because Though um, a lot of my work and practice of graphic design sort of really derives from typography as it, and is informed and fueled by it, I'm not a type designer per se in the classic sense. Um, okay, you're probably wondering what this is. Uh, so let's begin. Okay, frame rate. Um, as I'm sure you all know, this is also the title of uh, this talk. Um, is basically a term in motion graphics used to uh, describe the number of frames that are in a video per second, okay? So here you can see um, 60 frames per second, so it's not playing. And by the way, I apologize in advance if the GIFs are running slow. We saw that also yesterday. We all have pretty shitty computers, but we're just gonna uh, go forward and enjoy the 60 frames per second. Um, we have 30 frames per second and we have 10 frames per second, and we have five frames per second. Um, so as you can probably see, um, the frame rate really impacts the way things move. Um, more frames will lead to smoother motion. Um, few frames uh, will result in motion that has a really different character. Some will call it more choppy, some will call it maybe more cartoony. But I always think that it's so interesting how literally the same keyframing leads to just something totally different different character. Um, I like to think of frames as information. Um, they are bits of content um, that basically stories are made of. Um, and I think that in that way, typography and motion um, are very similar. Um, I like the word uh, of frames and the idea of frames because I think that this word can mean a lot of things, um, especially for designers. Um, a frame can be graphic, it can be pictorial, it can be physical, it could be a metaphor. A frame is a scene or a moment of concentration. Frames can be optional and they can be forced. A frame can also be a single part of a larger sequence of frames, like a video or even a series of books or a typeface. Um, it can also be a template or a border. Here, for example, speaking of book series, I designed five textbooks for high school students in Israel, uh, the country where I grew up. Um, each book is an annotated Greek tragedy. So we have Medea, Hercules, Antigone, King Oedipus, and Hippolytus. I hope I'm saying it right in English. Um, these books are designed as plays or annotated scripts um, for teenagers. <laughs> um, and throughout the books, there are different graphic tools that kind of enrich the story and provide more information. For example, these little notes here on the sides um, basically signify the level of emotion throughout the story. So you kind of show like a buildup of really a lot of intense emotions. Um, basically, um, for me, you know, each one of the stories, I don't know if you're familiar with these Greek tragedies, I know it sounds very old, um, but they're basically describing journeys of individuals going against some kind of frame. Antigone breaking the frame of the state, Medea breaking the frame of the family and the gods, and I think that these stories of breaking conventions are very relevant for young people in Israel today. So growing up in Israel really provided me a multitude of opportunities to become familiar with frames uh, and with borders. Um, here you can see a picture of part of the separation wall that Israel has erected to separate itself from Palestine. Like you can see, it has a nice drawing on it, so you can see the fake view on the other side that you're not allowed to go. Um, this is the view of where I grew up in northern Jerusalem. And right here you can see the university I attended in my graduate studies, undergraduate studies, sorry, Bezalel Academy of Art and Design. Um, and all around it uh, is a Palestinian village called Isawiya, which is located really right beneath it. 
Um, as you can maybe tell, there are pretty extreme differences between these two places. Um, they are so close and they are also very far away. In my years living in Jerusalem, I became involved in activist groups of both Palestinians and Israelis uh, fighting for equality. This book, entitled We Never Finished 1948, is a collection of frames documenting the ongoing displacement of Palestinians since the founding of the state. Um, I kind of like to maybe say or half apologize. This is the first graphic design job that I had. Today, I would have, you know, maybe designed the layouts differently, but still, it's a first time for me, and it's important for me, and um, it's also the first time in which I was able to align my frame of thought to a frame of action through design. So, fast forward. <laughs> um, when I moved to the States to attend grad school back in 2012, um, suddenly all the frames which I was used to and familiar with were no longer there in front of me, and I was sort of forced or, or I was facing a kind of emptiness in a way. And when I looked around me, there were all these wonderful old buildings, you know, nice and even cement sidewalks, very green trees, um, and very different people from different places. And uh, it was a little hard for me to locate myself in this new place at first. So, you know, in the beginning, I tried to preserve the place that I knew and to import it. So in this video, I projected the treetops from my neighborhood in Jerusalem onto an enclosed dark room right here in the States to try and simulate the feeling of being back there. Um, I also recorded a journey on Google Earth from Jerusalem to Ramallah, the capital of Palestine, and back. In reality, this journey is far from being so smooth and dreamy like this video. Um, but since this is my frame and my video, I can determine its reality in that way. So, Looking back, I think that this sort of emptiness that I felt kind of forced me to look inward. Um, if, if I can't grasp into my immediate surroundings, how can I make something? Um, and what can I bring out from myself to my surroundings? And how can I design and be present in the place where I am right now? Um, so I tried to design a stencil font, um, thinking of ways in which type can be embedded in space and used in space in a comfortable way. Um, a little bit unique for a stencil font, I know. Um, and uh, I sprayed it all over the city and got in a little bit of trouble for that, but it was very, very fun to work on. Um, and this is kind of like an example of, you know, designing something and bringing it out quite literally into um, my environment. Um, I also tried to take over a series of window displays of a shop under construction with images from an environment that I imagined. Um, you can see some of the pictures. Um, I tried to blend in with a t-shirt, quite literally. Um, and I tried to look back at art and history and find out what people did in order to make themselves present in the world. Here you can see a collection of paintings I found in which powerful figures lay their hand on the globe as a symbol of control over uh, the space. So I collected all these ideas and explorations into a book like one would do in grad school. <laughs> um, I won't bore you with the details. I'll just sort of go through it because there's a lot I want to go through. Um, bottom line, I think that this experience of going back to school was a good place for me um, to exercise new ideas and develop an understanding of my relationship with the frames I live and work within. It really helped me let go a little from where I came from and see things from a distance and be present here, um, most of all. Uh, so what came after school is a different story. Um, while I was uh, kind of finishing up my studies, I was contacted by Richard Turley, who asked me to join his uh, new team of visual storytelling at MTV News. Um, for those of you who don't know, Richard is a creative director who is really revolutionizing the state of media and news, I think. Um, here are some of his iconic covers of Bloomberg Business Week. Um, in his practice, he really kind of turns news upside down and tells it in a really different way and brings out so many funny, relevant angles. Um, our team at MTV kind of attempted to do something uh, that was related. We work with journalists to make daily short videos called micro-interstitials that showed news from the world through a lens of pop culture in a funny, not taking ourselves too ser seriously, not too precious kind of way. Um, we had um, spots with no ads, which is a rare moment on MTV. Um, we reminded people of things from today and also things from the past. 
um, and we really kind of just had a lot of fun. Um, and in terms of type, um, you know, when I joined this project, it was really the beginning of it, and we didn't really have anything to bind all the videos together. And each designer, we were a group of maybe five people, just made what they could make. We had to make like three or four of these a day, and they would air on the same day, and we had to do the sound and everything. So, you know, we were kind of working really fast and finding a way to make the videos more kind of tied together. Um, and then one day, I think I got an email from Richard, and the subject line just said something like, try this. Um, and inside was um, a, fo a zip folder with Druk by commercial type. Then it was not released yet. <laughs> and um, I think, you know, our team started using Druk mostly, and that was sort of a really turning point for us in that uh, project. Suddenly all the videos, even though they were really wildly different from each other, um, they started to sort of have uh, something shared. Um, and like you probably know, Druk is a very versatile typeface. It has a very distinct look. Um, but it really kind of let the team do lots of really varied things. Um, so here I was uh, having uh, to balance and connect several frames, the news story, the brand, the audience, the team, and my own interpretation um, between all of this. Um, though this was a new territory for me, very new territory, <laughs> I found that having to tell the news through my lens allowed me to become more immersed and involved in my surroundings. Slowly, I started to form an opinion um, and find a way to visualize it. Also, when I teach, I, um, I try to encourage students to form opinions about things that are happening around them. Um, sometimes they form their own news stories, sometimes they create their own channels, sometimes um, they just kind of make their own content, content for broadcasting. Um, and it's really fun just to see what they want to do. Some students want to do stuff about sneakers, some students want to do stuff about Russia, just really, really interesting, and I love it. Okay, so not really news, um, but this way of sort of reframing a story and telling it through a specific lens is something that I've experienced on more occasions, also on work that I did for MAC Cosmetics. So each season during Fashion Week, uh, MAC creates a campaign. In autumn, winter 2017, the campaign looked like this, a little bit weird. <laughs> Uh, we collaborated with Culture Sport, which is an excellent animation studio, to form these weird characters that lived in this super colorful world. We didn't really show any makeup. Instead, we showed a kind of fantasy that we made up. And that's something that I really like about this campaign. Um, it's very different. <laughs> um, I was asked to design a book that basically summarizes all the shows in Fashion Week that Mac did the backstage makeup for and all the kind of activity around Fashion Week in a way that sort of shows what happened in the spirit of the campaign and the weird, uh, grotesque characters. <laughs> um, so here you can see some of the spreads. And uh, basically the process of working on it was kind of taking together all sorts of little bits of reportage, animation, photography, and content, and sort of make this into a, a pretty big book. Um, and it, you know, it was interesting because it's kind of building, uh, you know, different building a world that's made out of different worlds, and taking content from different places and placing it all under one frame. And there is a funny tradition in the design of the trend book in each uh, fashion week. Since the designers don't get credited in this book. I don't know, beauty industry is weird. Um, we are allowed to plant what they call an Easter egg, which is a hidden portrait of yourself in the frame. Um, so here I am wearing a pink hat in the Missoni runway show, expressing myself and leaving my mark. Um, Okay, working with different companies and brands, um, I was actually surprised to discover that a lot of what I thought about branding was actually quite different in reality. And instead of being asked to design logos and systems for unification and brand consistency, I was actually asked to do something different, um, to develop content that challenges the set frame of the brand. Um, here at Giphy, for example, I worked with the amazing studio Dark Igloo um, and was asked to form a collection of videos using only the colors of the brand. Um, so you can see they're really fun um, and really, really simple. Really just use the colors and make something that you can just sort of watch and that will loop infinitely. Let's say it's playing. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting for me to work um, on these types of things and relationships. Um, and it kind of helps me develop a relationship with a kind of framework. 
and I have a set of restrictions and a context that I have to work within, but the reason I'm here is so I can challenge and repurpose all these things. One of the more strange cases in which I was asked to develop content for a brand and extend its frame uh, was while uh, working with Squarespace, um, as a website building platform I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, a year ago, they were gearing up towards launching their Super Bowl ad featuring Keanu Reeves and his uh, fancy motorcycle company, which he launched using Squarespace. Um, the creative directors had this huge ad they were working on. It was really expensive, really sophisticated, but they needed a way to translate this campaign into social media. And that is where me um, and the team at Squarespace came in. Um, so in response, we wa I wanted to relate um, to a kind of existing phenomena of Keanu memes, maybe you are familiar with it, and sort of um, form a new series of Keanu sending really ridiculous positive messages about building websites to the world. Um, so here are the results of what we did. It's very strange. Cleanse your mind of no. Who but you can make your website? I believe you can believe. I believe. <laughs> I believe. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So we basically kind of took Keanu's good energy and we took words that he said and we put them out in space for everyone to kind of get inspired and build a website. Um, so yeah. Um, okay, one of my favorite parts of living in the city is getting to know people and collaborating with them. This brings me to Little Cinema, uh, which Ellen mentioned briefly. So somewhere back in 2015, a friend of mine, Jay Linsky, uh, was starting a series of what he called immersive film screenings. Um, he asked me to work with him on developing content uh, for each show, as well as designing the promotional materials for the event. Here you can see a few pictures of the shows that we have done throughout the years. So I started to work with him and kind of make content that would be projected on each film. And you know, we collaborated with dancers and musicians and other performers to sort of really uh, create crazy events. We used to do this every week, now we do it maybe every month. Actually, as we're speaking, they are in Bonnaroo doing a sh you know, three shows, so good for them. Um, and here are some of the videos. Again, you're seeing red flashes because there isn't, maybe you're not seeing red flashes. Okay, you can sort of see some of the content. <laughs> um, we also uh, have like an intermission screen that kind of fills up over 15 minutes. Two minutes, oh my gosh, okay. We made posters, um, and I'll just sort of skip this um, because it's a lot. Um, thinking of frames, again, Little Cinema allowed me to break out of the frame of the day-to-day -day work and activate my skills in a different way. It also shows me that you know everyone who's involved um, really kind of comes into this process of rethinking the traditional way of watching a film and expanding the experience together. Um, I'm just gonna skip this. Um, so, Little Cinema kind of brought me together with um, the Little Cinema community and uh, the sort of people at House of Yes, the nightclub in which we do these shows, and I became involved with the VJs there uh, in the parties, and I used to just sort of make all this content that we used during the parties, and it was really fun. Um, so thinking about those MTV days in which I had a day to work on like three videos, here I had to create enough content to fill like six hours of video. Um, and this sort of led me to diversifying the way that I work. And instead of making one video at a time, I would make a bunch of simple loops, which I could then combine uh, and sort of use during the show. And you know, I used to have maybe like um, a day to create three videos, and now I had like six hours to create, or I had like three days to create six hours of a show. And so you just sort of move from really producing lots and lots of content. Okay, I'm almost finishing, I have two more projects, I think. So working independently really brought um, me a really a great variety of clients. One of them is Ion Design Magazine, and here I had the pleasure of designing the Psych Issue. Maybe you know of it. Um, I collaborated with Tala Safia, a wonderful designer who's here in the audience. 
Um, while I was doing research for the psych issue, I came across a peculiar thing in these references, you know, of you know, uh, psychedelic posters and Moscato and all these amazing designers. Um, I noticed that all these posters had a frame. You must think I'm obsessed with frames, but um, you can kind of see that there's a very abstract sort of uh, frame in each of these posters. And it was weird to me because I expected these posters to just be really crazy and all over the place but instead they were all very bounded in a frame. Um, I was also wondering about the colors, the you know, um, day glow colors in these posters, and I learned that the use of day glow ink came from actually road signs, which is interesting if you think about you know, these posters and the psychedelic movement of being some kind of transformative design experience. Um, so this is where we ended up. We used day glow ink, and we used a lot of frames in the design. Um, and I wanted to really repurpose the frames and weave them into the narrative of the magazine and create a series of frames that led the reader from one story to the next. This is the inside of the pictures. Um, when we launched the magazine, um, we also uh, wanted to have a party. And I was asked to make the graphics for the party because that's also one of the things that I do. Um, so I went back to the huge board that I sort of made all these frames and I decided to, in a way, reimagine them in motion and uh, came up with just all these animations that were projected in space in the party and it was really, really fun. I'm going to go so, so fast. I apologize. Okay. At Pentagram, I work with a wonderful team um, with Emily Oberman, who I think is a really exceptional, amazing designer. We worked on the identity and graphics for the Film Independent Spirit Awards that happened in February. Uh, Emily's team works on this uh, identity every year. It's an event, and uh, we really get to do all the fun details, a custom logo for the show, um, all the sort of idea, the category animations. Um, we also do the stage graphics. Um, you can maybe recognize these stage graphics. <laughs> uh, we also did a bunch of lower thirds. Um, and, you know, but just sort of looking at, uh, you know, this project, sorry, I think it's not working. Um, all right. Um, we wanted to sort of make the type feel gigantic and at the same time weightless. Um, and we wanted to sort of, uh, in a way, communicate with other traditions of, you know, type in superhero films and Superman, but we wanted to bring it back in a way that felt more new and more current. Um, and it was just really fun to work with and reimagine, in a way, this awards show in, uh, in a totally different way. Um, okay, in my s little spare time, uh, I also work with Medium and do, occasionally, uh, do occasional fun illustrations. Um, this is for an article. Um, about the f rise and fall of TiVo <laughs> and basically how it transformed the way people consume entertainment at home, something that I kind of think about in my work in general. Um, I was also part of the project of Words That Matter, in which each designer gets a word to animate. I got the word grieve, a very fun word, as you can see. Um, this is for an article, Should We and Could We Advertise in Space? an article about resilience and design of design as kind of like an important thing of the 21st century and how to survive in a world of change and basically how you have to stop designing for the best case scenario. Don't really ask me, I don't really know how to solve problems. Um, how autocomplete is sucking the life out of our communication. Um, and these are a bunch of treatments for an article about um, the beauty of the weird promoted tweets that happen. Uh, by accident. Um, okay, the very last project I'm going to show um, is about voting. Um, so as a recent trans transplant, though I was interested in what was going um, on, I didn't really feel quite connected to the politics here. And so I didn't really take the trouble to register to vote, I admit. Um, but this time around, in the last midterm elections, I did vote in 2016. <laughs> uh, it didn't work out very well. Um, but at this time, I didn't want just to vote, I wanted to do something else and I wanted to encourage other people to vote because I discovered that a lot of people in the creative community don't vote. I think they probably think they're like too cool to care or something like that. Um, so I wanted to do something to encourage people to first register to vote. So I made a very short like five minute video every day 
in the maybe like two months leading up to um, the elections um, and or the voting. <laughs> and here you can see some of them. Um, once the deadline for registration was over, um, I just encouraged them to actually go vote because sometimes it's easy to, um, you know, say I have a meeting at work and not go do it. Um, we also built a website and we had a party and pro or projected videos and raised awareness and encouraged people. And these are some of them that you can see here. Um, so basically, as a whole, bottom line, again, the video is not playing. Uh, as a whole, I, I love what I do. I hope that shows, <laughs> even though it's a little all over the place. Um, and I think that, you know, for me, work, first of all, it is a way for me to connect to where I am. You know, the city I'm in, um, the clients and industries around me, the people I'm with, and in a way, creating frames help me move between them and, and feel more comfortable and present. And I hope that my work helps you feel that, that way as well. Um, so thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.